Hello and welcome to episode 7 of the history of BBC Micro Typing Games. After a couple of months break I'm back to continue looking at typing games for the Beeb that were published in the many computer magazines of the 8-bit era. As well as trying to work out if it was actually worth the time it took to type the games in, I'll also pick out any interesting articles or adverts from the magazine to help give a flavour of the state of computing at that time. In this episode I'm going to begin my journey through 1984 and I'll be looking at four magazines from January and February of that year. 1984 was one of the BBC Micro's most successful years, as over 85% of British schools that bought computers that year chose Acorn's machine. It was also a great year for games, with many excellent arcade clones and original games being released, including the legendary Elite. The overall quality of games was hugely improved over previous years, but was that improvement seen in the typing listings for the system? Let's find out as we begin this episode with the January issue of the trusty Micro user. I'll begin by looking at the front cover and this one's a very fetching shade of lime green. As you can see this is volume 1 number 11 and the cover price is still a pound at this point which is pretty good value for over 100 pages. Nice simple layout for this one and front and centre is the game that I'm going to be looking at from this issue which is Barrel Battle, their game of the month. Down the left hand side as you can see we've got G. Cole Mysteries Explained, Multitone Screen Dump for Epsons, Micro Music Made Easy and Beginners Space Out with Tab. Also it's still featuring the Electron user as a pull out at this point in time and is also a big feature on adventure games. Let's jump inside then and I'll move straight to the news pages of which there are several. Starting off with Royal Gift is a boost for Acorn and this is a story about the Queen giving a regal gift of five of the BBC's microcomputer networks to the President of India. Which from the perspective of Acorn means they're getting the computer into that market and giving them a chance to sell the machines over there. And the other headline that stood out is Sexist Duo Under Fire. Two of Acornsoft's latest releases have caused a flood of controversy in the world of the BBC Micro, not least from feminist groups. Described by critics variously as rather silly and extremely bad taste, the programmes I Do and The Dating Game are Acornsoft's attempts to cash in on the psychological testing of faddism prevalent on the other side of the Atlantic. Described as marriage guidance by computer, I Do is based on a series of questionnaires used by controversial psychologist Hans Aikson in his latest book. It goes on to say the dating game consists of four separate programs, a computer dating and compatibility program, a love style analyzer, a preferred relationship indicator and a dating skills examiner. The compatibility ratings cater for both friendship and romantic attachment and Acorns say work for homosexuals as well as heterosexuals. That was very forward thinking back in 1984. Now I'm not familiar with either of those programs, never had any encounters with them when I was a kid unsurprisingly, but if you made use of any of them back in the day then let me know in the comments what they were like. For the rest of my look at this magazine I'm just going to be focusing on a few adverts and this one stood out on page 113, the BBC Sharpshooter Package, an exclusive offer from Superior Software. They had a limited number of high quality light sensitive guns for use with the BBC Micro. Each of these highly accurate guns is supplied with challenging machine code programs to test to the limit your skills as a marksman. So this is something I never knew existed for the BBC Micro back in the day, a light gun, and it cost just £19.95 inclusive of postage presumably that is. I'm presuming not many of these were manufactured and I'm sure they're pretty rare to get a hold of now but if you had one back in the day then once again let me know in the comments what it was like. And moving towards the very back of the magazine where there's a ton of adverts this one stood out to me as well the BBC Microcomputer Car Badge. Yes you could get a badge for your car emblazoned with the BBC Micro Owl. The colour was cream on dark brown background which must have been lovely and it's metal die cast chromed and enamel complete with back plate and grille fittings, badge bar and bumper fitting holes and it was just 4 99 including post and packaging. This was available from Hawthorne based in Hyde Cheshire and was officially licensed by BBC Enterprise. Did any of you watching this video kit out your car with a BBC Micro badge back then? Once again let me know in the comments. And the final thing to look at on the back cover, as has become traditional with episodes of this series, is a MicroPower advert. Now I think I've actually looked at this one in the previous episode, but this is the advert for Zarm, which is a kind of Lunar Lander style clone. And you can see there's lots of spaceships on there nicely drawn, and also a logo that seems like it's ripping off the Star Wars logo ever so slightly. As I say, I think I've covered that in a previous episode, so we'll move on. As I was skipping back to the game listing and as I've just mentioned an advert that ripped off Star Wars slightly, I noticed this advert for Sentinel which I think is a Tempest clone but it's also got a very obvious rip off of Boba Fett's Slave 1 spaceship in the middle there. Star Wars unsurprisingly having a bit of an influence on the gaming industry as well as the film industry at this point in time. Time to move on to the game listing from this magazine then and as I mentioned earlier it's Barrel Battle and as the title here says it's a barrel of fun and there's a big screenshot of the game here done in a strange colour scheme because it's not like that when you actually play the game and the description of the game says do you ever feel like having a cup of tea but things keep getting in your way well that's what our latest game is all about you have to work your way up the ladders and along the ledges collecting teapots along the way when and if you get to the top you have to ring your friends to come for a cuppa 
It's great fun, but the better you get at it, the harder it becomes. All in all, it's pretty thirsty work. And there's a picture of the main character here with a teapot in his hand and some barrels coming after him. A uh, pretty strange premise for a game, collecting the teapots and then getting to a telephone. I think we can obviously see what game this is inspired by to some extent. And the rest of this two-page spread that introduces the game consists of a breakdown of what each section of the program does, covering all the different lines, and also an overview of all the variables used in the game. And we can see here we've got variables for high score, your score, X position of barrel N, Y position of barrel N. So there are arrays holding the X and Y position of each barrel in the game, and there's also arrays covering the direction of the barrel's movement, and various things checking whether the barrel's dropping, the characters behind and under the barrels, and so on. Other notable variables to pick out are the sheet in play, the number of lives, the number of teapots remaining, various variables relating to the movement of your character, and a few related to music it seems to be playing in the game as well. So as with most game listings in the micro user, the listing itself doesn't start until later in the magazine, so let's jump to page 123 and see what it looks like. The listing spans three pages, so it's not particularly long, but annoyingly there's adverts in between some of those pages, so it's quite hard to flip through and have a look at. I don't think there's anything particularly outstanding about this one, but what I did notice is it's using a slightly unusual line numbering structure. Usually you'll see lines 10, 20, 30, 40 and so on, giving you the option to put extra line numbers between the ones that are there if you need to. But in this case, they've numbered them 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, so there's no scope for adding any extra lines in if you wanted to. You'd have to renumber the whole listing. As is typical, it begins by defining data used in the program. In this case, the sound envelopes and then VDU23 definitions for the different characters used within the game. Following that, there's a large number of variable declarations setting up all those variables that were mentioned earlier. As I move on to the second page of the listing, the other thing that stands out is there's very few procedures used here. It uses a lot of go subs to move around the program, and the only procedure I could find is proc ladder, which obviously draws the ladder on the screen. And you can see that in use here in what is presumably the setup of the different levels. As you can see, proc ladder called a number of times with two parameters passed in, which are presumably the locations of each of the ladders on the level. So it seems like each of the game's four levels are drawn out on the screen in a rather laborious way. You can see lots of print tab statements, characters being drawn out using the string function to create sequences of them, and spaces being drawn as well. This doesn't seem like the most efficient way of doing things and perhaps explains why there's only four levels in the game. The latter part of the listing covers the instructions and it also shows that there's a number of options in the game including choosing which level to start on and the number of barrels you have to contend with. So as I said, it doesn't seem like the most sophisticated listing but let's see what kind of a game it's produced. So as I was just saying, the game does begin with some instructions, as you'd expect most of these games do. They're done pretty simply in Mode 7 with double height characters for the title and a variety of colours for the different sections. And it says you must collect all the teapots then ring your friends for a cup of tea before your bonus reaches zero. You get 50 points per teapot plus 20 points per barrel jumped well. Presumably by jumped well it means you actually manage to jump them rather than getting hit by them. Movement is done using the classic BBC micro keys of Z and X for left and right and colon and slash for up and down, and you jump using the space bar. And as I alluded to when looking at the listing, there are a number of game options. You can change your starting level, you can turn sound on or off, and you can also set the number of barrels. To begin with though, I left all the settings at default and started the game. So when the game starts, you're presented with a colourful layout of platforms and ladders. Your little character starts in the bottom left and you've got to make your way to the top of the screen, collecting all the pink teapots and eventually touching the blue telephone at the top right to complete the level. Impeding your progress are three barrels which spawn at the top of the screen and roll down the platforms in different directions. Contact with a barrel will cause you to lose a life and reset the level, and you can also lose lives by falling off the end of platforms. When you collect the last teapot, a bonus will begin to count down, and you have to reach the telephone and complete the level before the bonus runs out. This game is obviously influenced by Donkey Kong, but it's actually more of a collect em up platformer. The Mode 2 graphics are simple but colourful, there's some satisfying sound effects for jumping and the barrels landing on a lower platform, and the game even plays a little tune when you complete a stage. Movement of your character in the barrels is quite jerky, which reflects the amount of work the program's having to do to move everything around, and as a result the controls are a little unresponsive. It doesn't take long to realise that unlike Donkey Kong, the barrels never go down the ladders, so are fairly easy to avoid, though they do move quickly and can respawn in different places once they reach the bottom of the level, so you have to be on your guard as you get higher up. Once you reach stage 2, you'll learn that your character rigidly jumps four blocks when jumping left or right, and can hit walls and die if you don't jump at the right point to get a clean landing. That's annoying to begin with, but it's just something you have to be aware of as you make progress. The bonus counting down after collecting the last teapot is a nice idea and adds some urgency to the game, essentially working as a timer. There's some nice customization options, allowing you to make it easier by reducing the number of barrels or practice the later levels, so those are well thought of by the programmer, making it more accessible. There's no high score table and only four levels, so there's certainly some areas for improvement, but overall this is a reasonably well designed arcade game and not too frustrating, which makes it fairly addictive. With only just over 100 lines to type in, albeit some quite long ones, I think this one would have provided enough enjoyment to have been worth the effort.
Let's move on to the second magazine in this episode then, and this is the January 1984 edition of Computer and Video Games. A very impressive image of Sherlock Holmes on the front cover there, for reasons I'm not entirely sure about, because it doesn't mention anything about him other than just having this big picture. The one thing it does mention is, similar to the micro user that I just looked at, we have a book of adventure, a free pullout that's got information about adventure games, which is not something I'm going to be looking at, but it's interesting that both this and the micro user are both focused on adventure games in their January 1984 edition. There's not much else of note on the front cover, so let's dive in, and the first thing I'm going to look at is on page 16, which is one of the news articles entitled American Invaders on the Way, and as you can see there, the subtitle there is Electronic Arts, and it says Electronic Arts is the name of a new American software house set up by a group of independent electronic games designers, and it goes on to say the best known of those is Bill Budge, who wrote the hit pinball simulation Raster Blaster. He's slightly apologetic for the arts angle being used to promote the company's games, saying I'm not so sure there are many software artists yet, maybe we've got to earn that title. The article then says the games are causing quite a stir across the Atlantic and are now also available in the UK and mentions several of the games that are available at that point in time, Pinball Construction Set, Archon and Murder on the Zinder Nerf and it rounds off by saying all games come on disc for the Atari with 48k and the Commodore 64 and the price of the games at that point in time 29.95, which was quite a lot of money for a game in 1984. So interesting there to see the very early days of a company that would go on to be one of the biggest in games over the next 40 years. I've now moved on to later in the magazine, this is page 91 and an advert for Chucky Egg which is obviously a very well known game from this era. You can see at this point it was available for the BBC Electron Dragon and Spectrum and it's given the headline there's trouble at the farm. There are several other games mentioned on this advert from ANF Software but there's no doubt that Chucky Egg was probably their most famous game and along with a description of the game which probably doesn't need to be repeated, I'm sure you know what it's like, you've got an order form for the game, it also gives details of which retail outlets you can buy the game from and you can see the price of the game at that point in time for most systems was £7.90 or £6.90 for the Spectrum and I don't think anyone would argue that would be money well spent for any of those systems for this classic game. I've now moved on to page 156 and something that many of you might remember from back in the day, the Software Club. This I think eventually morphed into the Home Computer Club, although that might have been a different organisation doing the same thing. And basically this is an offer where you can send off for three games at a low price to enrol you into the software club, which you then have to buy a game from every month from a magazine that they send you. At this point the introductory offer was three games for £2.99 each plus post and packaging and as you can see some of the games that are included in the offer are Attic Attack and Lunar Jetman from Ultimate, a number of Quicksilver games and Attack of the Mutant Camels and Hoverbover from Llamasoft. BBC Micro users were also covered by the offer as they could get Cylon Attack, Attack on Alpha Centuri and Gunsmoke amongst others. And the final thing to look at in this magazine before moving on to the games listing is this advert from Imagine Software who are advertising for a number of positions within the company and it says at the top here Imagine Software is the largest and most successful game software house outside of the USA with more than 100 staff occupying 19,000 square feet of premises throughout Liverpool. They're at the forefront of today's exciting software industry and as a result of their advanced and imaginative expansion program the following positions have become available and it goes on to list those positions including senior software manager, software managers, software artists and games programmers, systems software programmers, programmers, graphics programmers, computer musicians, game designers, technical writers and graphic artists. The company certainly was betting big on its future success at this point in time but as we know it didn't really pan out as they expected as six months from this point they were facing bankruptcy. Let's move on to the game listing from this magazine then, and the game is called Crawler. As you can see, there's a two-page spread here introducing the game. Strangely, one half of it is on a black and white page, and the other half's on a colour one. So you've got the caterpillar and the word crawler and the carrot and the plants all in green on the right-hand side. And on the left-hand side, a very black and white Wellington boot which is encroaching on the territory of the crawler. The review of this one says, Defend your garden from the creepy crawler. This nasty insect has invaded your vegetable patch and has only one aim in life, to eat everything it sees. Is a caterpillar an insect? I don't think it is at that point. I know it does turn into one, but I don't think it is at the point it's a caterpillar. Anyway, the crawler moves down the screen at you while you blast away at it with deadly slug pellets. So, is it a slug? Uh, It's a bit contradictory, this introduction, it's fair to say. If the crawler hits a mushroom or reaches the side of the screen, it reverses direction and moves down the line. If it eats an apple, then its length increases by one segment. Your aim is to stop it reaching the bottom of the screen. If it manages this twice, you'll lose one of three lives, and you'll also lose a life if the crawler hits you with one of its deadly insect bombs. In order to finish off the crawler completely, you have to hit its head with one of your pellets, and hitting the body simply scores points. You can also score points by hitting the mushrooms and apples, but beware the mushrooms split into three when hit, so you'll have to be careful not to give the crawler an easy path to the bottom of the screen. You'll get bonus points if you hit the crawler's head. It goes on to say if you reach a thousand points the crawler starts to get a bit wiser, it can detect your position and drops bombs with alarming accuracy. If you pass 3000 points the bombs might just start chasing you. You'll have to chase them down before they hit you and you'll get an extra life for every 20,000 points. 
There's a top 10 feature built into the game, that's a high score table, but you'll have to get over 10,000 to get into it. And it rounds off by saying the creator of the game, Mark Hall, says his own top score is around the 50,000 mark. Can you beat him? Well, I'm pretty sure I won't be able to. Let's now take a quick look at the listing. As you can see, it starts on these two pages here. It then skips a couple of pages, but then moves on. And there's a third page there on page 83 and a final page on page 84. This is another one that's got a strange numbering format. It's not got the usual 10, 20, 30 notation. Instead, it seems to have different sections for different parts of the code, each of which starts with a higher number. So you can see it starts at line 100 and has a sequence of lines immediately after that, then jumps to line 200 for another section, and then straight to line 4,000, then 5,000, and so on through the listing so it's a bit of a strange system but it does give you plenty of room to add extra lines in if you needed to in terms of what's going on in the listing well you can see straight away right at the top here it's using mode 2 and there's lots of procedures so you've got proc define proc assemble and proc instructions on the very first line of any note there you can also see it declares some envelopes there so some sounds going to be used as you'd expect I suppose the main thing to look at really is proc assemble because that suggests it's going to be using some machine code not that I'm going to be able to understand what that machine code is but it's interesting to take a look at it anyway so the definition for proc assemble begins at line 6200 which sounds like a high number but actually it's probably only about 30 lines in based on how the numbering of this listing works but that's just at the bottom of the second page and the main part of this assembly listing is on the third page so I'll move over to that and what you can see is quite a large section of machine code commands none of which I really understand but you can see a loop there and the various other commands are executed until that section of code ends at line 6380 we then see more understandable basic procedures defined such as proc key, proc fire, proc miss move which is probably the movement of a missile I would imagine and various other definitions as the listing continues. One thing that did stand out that I thought was quite interesting was proc score. You can see here proc score has a parameter passed into it. So when you want to set the score or up the score by 100, then you send in 100 and the next line there sends in 25. This is going to be for when you hit certain items on the screen. And proc score is defined just a little bit further down where you can see that n% percent is passed in as a parameter. And no surprise to see that sc% percent the score is updated by having n% percent added to it. But another thing it does is say that if score divided by 20,000 is greater than a certain value there, then it makes life percent equal life percent plus one. So that's basically handling the extra lives routine as well. On the final page of the listing, the program code continues, but you can also see the game over routine here, printing game over on the screen and also checking for the high score saying if the score is greater than high 10, which is the 10th position in the array of high scores, then it calls proc high score and that then follows further down where you can enter your name. And like a lot of these listings, they've left the instructions section to the end. Here you can see the definition of the instructions right at the very end of the listing. And with that, let's move on and look at the game. The game begins with some pretty simple instructions. All you really get is the score that you're getting for the different parts of the enemy and also for shooting the apples, mushrooms and bombs. And when you press a key for more, you're given the controls, which are simple Z and X to go left and right and space to fire. And then you can press a key to start the game. The game screen is then displayed in mode 2 and if you hadn't already guessed this is a pretty straightforward centipede clone but to be fair there are a few differences from the arcade game. The aim is slightly different as all you have to do to complete a stage is shoot the head of the centipede. There are no enemies like the spider or fleas from the arcade game and you can't move up the screen only left and right. Unlike in the arcade game shooting the mushrooms multiplies them rather than destroying them which can be used to trap the centipede in a small area and make it easier to hit the head. It also means it comes down the screen more quickly though. The game runs quite slowly due to the number of sprites being moved around, especially when there are lots of mushrooms on screen or the centipede's long. You can only fire one shot at a time, which is quite slow, so there's a lot of hit and hope until the centipede gets low enough to aim at better. The Chunky Mode 2 graphics are pretty good with single colour sprites but plenty of variation in those colours, though it would benefit from changing the colours between stages to give a feeling of progression. The sounds are not very good though, being high pitched and mostly annoying. The difficulty level seems to stay the same between stages in terms of the speed of the enemy, though once you reach certain score thresholds it does get more aggressive by throwing bombs at you. I found pressing space to fire a little awkward, but that could be changed quite easily in the code. As I mentioned when looking at the listing, it includes a high score table, so the presentation is pretty good, and although the game is not amazing, it's a reasonable alternative to a full price centipede clone. I'd say it would have been worth typing in if you didn't already have a game of this type, especially as there's some room for enhancement if you want to play around with the listing.
Moving on to the third magazine in this episode, this is issue number 48 of Home Computing Weekly, covering the period of the 7th to the 13th of February 1984. And as you can see, this is a great St. Valentine's issue. There's heartfelt games to type in for the VIC-20 Spectrum, BBC Electron and Commodore 64. And no surprise, that's the game I'm going to be looking at from this issue. It also mentions that the software reviews for the BBC Spectrum, Commodore 64 and more, and there's a game that stands out there, which is a game I reviewed on my Witchfinder's Gaming Vault series recently, Crystals of Zong for the Commodore 64, so I'm going to have a look at what Home Computing Weekly thought of that back in the day to compare with my own review, which you can see by clicking the link in the corner if you wish. There's also a competition in the bottom left corner here, Win Arcadia, the chart topper from Imagine. We've got 182 tapes to give away, which seems like a rather random number of tapes to give away in a competition, for the first thing I'm going to look at in this issue, I'm going to stay on the front cover for this article on the right hand side here, Bosses in Comex Rescue Mission. And zooming in, the article says two bosses from Hong Kong computer makers made a flying visit to London to rescue the reputation of their micro, the Comex 35. Never heard of the Comex 35? Well obviously you didn't watch episode 4 of this series where I looked at an advert for that computer, but no, I hadn't heard of it either before looking at that. It goes on to say they're also seeking a new distributor for a relaunch next month following the collapse of Moran Brook trading as Computers for All. Comex was badly hit by a report in Home Computing Weekly that 55% of the computers failed CFA tests and that 600 have been recalled from dealers. On his UK visit, Thomas Yu, General Manager of Comex World Operations, said the first we knew about it was when we saw the article. The article continues inside in much detail, which I'm not going to go into, but it goes on to say that the failures were caused by faulty hermetic seals on two ICs supplied by an outside company which allowed in humidity, and it only affected the first batch of 2000 which Comex had produced. Plenty more information about this computer is given in the article, but let's be honest, it was not a success, so let's not dwell on it any further. The next thing I'm going to take a look at in this edition of Home Computing Weekly is the charts. So let's have a look at the top 10 programs for various computers. Unfortunately, the BBC Micro isn't featured in this very heavily, but there's an overall top 30 and then a top 10 for various other systems. So just to pick out a few highlights, at the top of the Commodore 64 chart is International Football, and you can also see Forbidden Forest in there. For the Spectrum, checkered flags at the top quite surprisingly, followed by Attic Attack and Death Chase, which are certainly more recognisable titles for the Spectrum at that point in time. Surprisingly, there's still a top 10 for the ZX81, which was a good three years old at this point, as well as the VIC-20, but I'm also going to look at the Dragon one, where the top game was 8-Ball, followed by Dragon Chess, neither of which sound particularly exciting. And moving back to the overall top 30, we can see some familiar titles at the top there, Hunchback, Manic Miner and Harrier Attack, followed by two Ultimate Games, Lunar Jetman and Jetpack making up the top 5, and you can also see The Hobbit, 3D Ant Attack, Kong, Zoom and Falcon Patrol rounding up the top 10. There are a couple of BBC Micro games further down, including the superior software version of Hunchback and Quicksilver's Mind Out. And I'm going to skip on to that review of Crystals of Zong, which is part of an adventure section. Yeah, that's the third magazine in a row that's got an adventure section. And while I think most of the games featured on this page are text adventures, as you'll know if you've watched my review of Crystals of Zong, that's definitely not a text adventure. So let's zoom in and see what Home Computing Weekly thought of the game. They describe it as a real-time arcade adventure, although it ends up being kind of a glorified Pac-Man, which I definitely agree with, and most of the review is just an overview of how to play the game. The final paragraph though says the graphics are reasonable and there are comprehensive instructions. I found the game did not have the addictive appeal of some that will draw you back time and time again. They also give some scores for various aspects of the game, with the instructions getting 80%, playability 40%, graphics 80%, and value for money 60%, giving it an overall score of 3 stars out of what I presume is 5. I would probably say that's a slightly harsh review for this point in time, although this game was released in 1983 and we're now into 1984 where perhaps better games were being released. That'll do for looking at a few articles in this magazine, it's only got 56 pages so let's not dwell on it too much, I'll move on now to looking at the game listing, and the game is called Stupid Cupid. The overview of the game says Cupid's younger brother Stupid has got it all wrong, he's out to break hearts instead of joining them. Type this game into your 32k BBC or Electron Micro and have some innocent fun thanks to authors Dave Carlos and John Revis. There's a more detailed overview of the gameplay which I'll skip over for now, but it does say here that you can type your own beloved's name into the program. If your lover's called Di, then you'll have an easier task than one called Esmeralda. This provides a method of increasing difficulty too. It also mentions that for those ladies who'd like to try catching the hearts of their gallant gents, it's very easy to change the program so that the men throw the hearts. The modifications involve replacing four lines in the program with the following amended versions given. So that's a nice touch. It also mentions from a programming perspective that the use of strings to change both graphics colours and to move around is a little unusual. They are used to make it easy to print the multicoloured people, some of whom need seven actual characters to be printed. This technique can save a lot of memory if used wisely. And it rounds off the introduction by saying greatest care needs to be taken over typing the data lines. A single mistake here can be very hard to find and can have highly unpredictable results. There's a pretty detailed overview of how the program works in a box out on the left hand side and also all the main variables of the program are described on the right. 
The listing then begins in the blue box out on the bottom right hand side of the first page and you can actually see the entire program flow is covered on about the first 15 lines. Starting with setting the game to mode 2 at line 10 and then doing a go to 10 and an end at line 140 and 150 respectively. Between those lines you can see the execution of a bunch of procedures so it seems like this one's fairly well structured. It continues on to the following two pages and comprises about 240 lines so not a particularly long program and none of it looks like it's particularly complicated. It's all the usual stuff we've seen on many of these listings before including sprite definitions, movement routines and procedures that check whether you've caught a heart. It's also probably the only game we'll see in this series that's got a procedure called Proc Love. At the end of the listing there's an additional box out that was mentioned on the first page which is the amendments to make the game for female players instead of male and I can already see the possibilities of improving this program by incorporating those lines into the main program and giving you the option to choose whether you want to play as a male or female player and setting these values accordingly. That about does it for looking at the listing on this one as I say nothing particularly outstanding there so let's get romantic and take a look at the game. Upon loading the game up there's some instructions printed on screen, I don't think these were actually in the original listing so these have probably been added by whoever typed this one in, but the key thing to pick out from it is that your aim is to steer Romeo to catch the hearts and build up his lover's name on the ground below him, and for every heart you catch an extra letter is added to the name. The game then loads up and it's got a pretty impressive looking title screen for a type in game, Stupid Cupid's written in the middle of the screen surrounded by hearts and you can see the three characters in the middle there, with your player character on the left with the net, your romantic interest on the right and Stupid Cupid in the middle, and it also tells you what the controls are with Z to go left and X to go right which sounds pretty simple. It also plays a fairly recognisable version of the Wedding March tune in the background. After that you go to a screen where you must enter the name of your true love and obviously I put in the name of my wife to begin with and it then asks you how earnest is your love on a scale of 1 to 5, effectively setting a difficulty level so I set it to 3 to begin with. The game then begins and it has to be said these graphics are pretty impressive for a typing game with a nice tower drawn on the left hand side with your love interest in the window at the top and stupid cupid in the lower window firing arrows. Your characters at the bottom of the screen and must move left and right to catch the hearts as they fall down hoping that stupid cupid doesn't shoot them and also that they don't land on the ground before you can catch them. Each time you catch a heart it will spell out the letters of the name you typed in before the game started and if you manage to spell the whole name out then the game ends successfully. If a certain number of hearts fall to the ground and break before you manage to complete the name then you fail and the game's over. Whichever outcome occurs a message is displayed on screen telling you how you got on. This is a very simple reaction based game which does have colourful well drawn graphics and pretty nice sounds too. As you've seen the difficulty level is derived from the combination of how long a word you choose and the skill level of 1 to 5, the higher giving you less chances to miss the hearts. Unfortunately the chance of completing your task is totally random as it all depends where the hearts drop. Some games can be completed in a matter of seconds if they drop close to you whereas others are impossible to win. The player character doesn't move fast enough to get across the screen in time to catch some of the hearts and the net has to be perfectly lined up so timing is vital. You don't get a score and there's very little incentive to try harder or play again once you've had a couple of tries. It's also annoying that you get the title screen every time you restart as it effectively just runs the entire game again from the beginning. The customizability of entering a name is obviously a good point but this needs a lot more work to make it any fun. It's barely a game as is but could perhaps be enhanced to have multiple rounds with the difficulty increasing each time by changing the speed of the hearts and the number that can be broken before you fail. It also needs some way of giving you a fair chance of catching everything, maybe having each heart spawning randomly but within a certain number of spaces from the last. Overall it was a neat idea for a Valentine's Day theme program and looks good but would only have been worth typing in if you were willing to spend some more time turning it into a proper game. I'm rounding off this episode by taking a look at a very faded scan of the February 1984 edition of Your Computer Magazine. The cover feature seems to be a game, 3D Spectrum Drachman, with the subtitle In Inner Space No One Can Hear You Scream, and I don't know what's going on with the image here, they seem to be portraying the Spectrum as a vampire because it's casting no reflection, you can also see a bat in the background there and garlic and other things on the table there, so I really don't know what's going on but it's not a very good cover. In terms of other things mentioned on the cover, the Coleco Adam gets a first hands on review and I'm going to take a little look at that, and the other thing to pick out is frogging on the BBC and ZX81, which is a clue to what type of game I'm going to be looking at in this one. The first thing I'm going to take a look at inside is a couple of adverts, and the first of those follows up from the one I looked at earlier which was Imagine advertising for a number of job roles, and this is the reason why, as we see an advert for their upcoming mega games, Cyclops and Bandersnatch, which as history tells us, never actually got released because the company went bankrupt, and one of the reasons for that was the money they invested trying to produce these games. The ad features four of the main programmers for Imagine, and I'm not sure this is a good way to advertise the games, because really, who wants to see four geeky programmers? Below it says when such computer wizards as Ian Weatherburn, Mike Glover, John Gibson and Eugene Evans are locked away for weeks on end, anything can happen. Well, what actually happened was not much, let's be honest. 
moving over to the facing page and you can see an advert for crash but it's not an advert for the magazine it's an advert for a bunch of games that they're selling so i was a bit confused by this one i never knew that crash was actually a distributor of games as well in the early days Zooming in a little closer, you can see a huge list of games that you're able to buy by ticking the relevant boxes. I have to say though, considering this came from a company that produced magazines, the layout of this advert is pretty poor. Delving a bit further into the magazine, after several very colourful games adverts, we get this advert for the BBC Micro, which says the BBC Micro can now give your children a private education. Yet once again, Acorn are going big on the fact that the BBC Micro is in use in a lot of schools, and the opening sentence says the BBC Micro computer now accounts for 80% of the computers being ordered under the current DOI primary school scheme, and it goes on to give lots of information about the educational software available for the computer. When you see adverts like this, it's not surprising that most people just discount the Beeb as an educational machine, is it? I've now moved on to the news pages where you get a look at the next generation of home computers and firstly there's an article about the Sinclair QL and a couple of pages on there's information about the new improved Auric Atmos. But on the page between those is probably what's the more significant of the articles here as it says all singing all dancing computer takes hi-fi Amstrad into high tech and this is the news that Amstrad are moving into the home computer market with a £200 64k microsystem including screen and tape recorder. Sources say the machine will be a Z80 based micro with 64k RAM, 80 column screen display, proper keyboard and built in tape recorder and that there may be two versions, one including a black and white TV screen for about £200 and the other including a colour monitor for around £280. Well as we know, that black and white TV screen actually became the green screen on what eventually was released as the Amstrad CPC 464. And above that is another article that stood out, say hello to your friendly robot chums Topo and Fred, Prism's articulate Androbots. It says Android bots are designed to be friendly personal robots that can think, talk, move, teach, learn and grow, or so it says in the sales brochure. The article describes Fred as looking like a Cyberman sawn off at the shoulders, and goes on to say that Prism, the big computer distributors, are developing versions of Fred for the Spectrum and other home micros. The publicity claims that it won't be long before an Android bot can mix you a drink, fetch your slippers and then perhaps settle down to a quiet evening's ironing, although it then goes on to say Topo is totally incapable of doing anything of the sort at present. I'm not sure if these robots ever actually made it to market, but if you've got any more information about them, then leave a comment and let me know. The final thing I'm going to look at in this magazine before we get onto the games listing, as I mentioned from the front cover, is the review of the Coleco Adam. Overpriced toy or bargain system. Kathleen Peel weighs up the Adam from Coleco, the people who brought you the Cabbage Patch Kids, and interestingly, they spelt ways wrong there, which is not a good start. Anyway, this is a very colourful two-page spread to kick things off and there's another page afterwards and as you can see, the Coleco Adam is shown there with a Cabbage Patch Kid operating one of its controllers and there's also some impressive screenshots of Book Rogers' planet to zoom down the left-hand side. This is a pretty comprehensive article so I'm not going to go into too much detail about it but the opening paragraph says the Adam is a word processor which can be used to run business programs and also the wide range of Coleco games cartridges. The Adam is currently sold in the States at $700 but the final UK price may be as much as £700. It then goes on to give a comprehensive write-up of the system which I'm not going to cover so let's jump to the final page which has got some conclusions and without going into too much detail they definitely seem to be reviewing this on the basis of it's going to be a business machine with comments like the philosophy may well be correct the small business user does not need basic just a tool which replaces a typewriter and runs business software plugged in or loaded from tape. It also says the success or lack of it will depend almost entirely on the business software and the initial impetus of the Adam has been lost by the late launch date and will probably be overshadowed in the UK by Sinclair's next ZX and later on by the baby IBM and a new Commodore business machine. Well, I'm not sure any of those things actually happened but the Coleco Adam certainly wasn't a big success in the UK or anywhere as far as I'm aware. Time to look at the game listing from this magazine then and it's Freeway Frog or to give it its more common title Frogger because you can quite clearly see a very good looking screenshot of the game there which is very obviously Frogger. Now the quality of the scan of this magazine isn't particularly good and as you can see the font size on some of the listings is absolutely tiny so I'm not going to be focusing on the listings at all and instead I'm just going to be looking at the text that accompanies this listing to give more of an overview of what it's like. The listing covers four pages overall with a bunch of adverts in between and there are several box arts that describe the listings in detail. Jumping back to the first page, the most significant thing that's mentioned is that the program demonstrates how machine code could be used to generate multicolor graphics quickly and easily, and that's something we saw in a listing in a previous episode of this series, a game called Fruit Worm that chained together several programs to load the game into memory, just as this one does. Following the introduction I just covered, there's a very detailed overview of how to play Frogger, which I'm sure everybody knew in 1984, as the arcade game was already several years old by that point. The programmer of the game then goes into a load of detail about how the three programs fit together and what they do, including lots of detail about how Graphics Mode 2 works. There's certainly a lot of information in this one if you want to better understand how machine code games programming works. 
On the final page, along with that detailed description of how Program 3 works, it says the listings are long and will take plenty of time and energy to type in, and the programmer offers to supply the game for £3 if you can't be bothered to type it in yourself. So on the face of it, this looks like one of the most sophisticated typing games we've seen so far. The question is, will it create a decent version of Frogger or not? Let's take a look at the game now and find out. Upon loading the game up you're presented with a decent title screen accompanied by a nice croaking sound and it's worth noting here that the game is just called Frogger, not Freeway Frog as the magazine said. You're then treated to an astonishing four pages of instructions. It's Frogger, how elaborate do you need to be to describe this game? Well, in the mind of the author of this program, very elaborate. The final page of the instructions gives you the controls which are the BBC standard ZNX for left and right and colon and slash for up and down. You then press the spacebar to load in the game and are given the choice of whether you want sound or not and you can also change the controls which is not the sort of thing you'd normally see in a typing game that's usually reserved for a commercial release. After that the game starts and surprise surprise it's Frogger and I don't think I need to explain how to play this game at all. This is a really good version of the classic arcade game with most of the original game's features included such as the crocodiles, turtles and flies. It even has the five lanes of traffic and logs on the river, unlike many home versions that sacrificed a row in each half of the play area due to the switch from vertical to horizontal screen orientation. The graphics are generally really good with lots of colour on most of the sprites and a good overall resemblance to the arcade game. The only letdown is the player sprite which is bland, lacking colour and animation and is yellow for some inexplicable reason. The sounds are pretty good too, with the croaking noise when getting a frog home being the standout. It's really only missing some music to make it a very good alternative to most retail versions of the game at this point in time. There's good progression of the difficulty, as new hazards like the crocs and turtles are introduced in a measured way as levels progress. This means that each new stage offers something new and the progression is noticeable, and it's quite a bit easier than the arcade original to begin with. There's a lot of movement being handled on screen, so as a result the sprites are a little slow and flickery. The game also lacks a high score table, so it's not perfect, but overall it's an excellent arcade clone for a type-in listing, which obviously benefits from the machine code routines. It would have been quite an epic to type in, and with the text size being so small on some of the listings, it probably would have been worth sending the author £3 instead to save the effort, and it would have been worth that money. That about does it for this edition of the History of BBC Micro Typing Games and the first of several episodes covering 1984. At the beginning I wondered whether this year would see an improvement in the quality of typing games in line with commercial ones, and based on the evidence seen here, it seems like there was. Frogger in particular is almost of comparable quality to a retail game, while both Barrel Battle and Craw are also well-made arcade games. Stupid Cupid was the least impressive of the bunch this time, but even that had some good visuals and the scope for making a better game from it. If you enjoyed this video then I'd appreciate you giving it a like and please leave a comment with any thoughts you have about the games or magazines I've featured. You can also check out the pinned comment for links to everything covered in this episode. Next time around I'll continue my review of 1984 with four more magazines and games listings. Until then, please stay tuned to this channel for lots more retro gaming content and thanks very much for watching.